Um, my name is Don Black. I'm on the Friends Executive Committee. And a good friend uh, just asked a few minutes ago what, what brought me here. Was I particularly interested in, in uh, public education? And, and obviously, having been a product of, of public education, uh, I think we're all, we're all intensely interested. But especially in a center like this of, of higher education, I think we're interested in the process of understanding and making sure that there are uh, plenty of people to follow us who are also interested in, in uh, all the things we're, we're discovering all the time, or the, the, the people here who work at the Institute and those of us who are friends who are uh, following along and, and seeing what's happening. So I have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Charles Payne. He's a 1415 uh, friend of the Institute member in the School of Social Science. Dr. Payne's home institution is the University of Chicago, where he was the Frank where he is the Frank Hickson Distinguished Service Professor in the School of Social Service Administration. And he's also an affiliate of the Urban Education Institute. Dr. Payne holds a bachelor's degree in African American Studies from Syracuse University and a PhD in Sociology from Northwestern. His research interests include urban education and school reform, social inequality, social change, and modern African American history. He's a co-founder of the Duke Curriculum Project, which involves university faculty and the professional development of public school teachers, and also co-founder of the Johns Hopkins Franklin Scholars, which tries to better prepare high school youngsters for college. At the Institute this year, he's working to synthesize what we've learned in the last 15 years about changing urban schools and school systems to give children better options in life, and looking closely at the data he aims to develop a set of grounded hypotheses to guide both practice and further research. The title of this evening's talk is 50 Years of Reforming Urban Schools, What Should We Have Learned? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Payne. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mr. Black, for, the, for that introduction. Uh, this is a great audience. Um, I do, I, frankly, I do quite a bit of public speaking, but I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I just don't get to speak much about education in New Jersey. Those of you who really know South Jersey, I grad graduated elementary school in Woodbine, New Jersey. That's the northern end of Cape May County. And I'm a graduate class of 66, Millville High School. All right. So speaking in New Jersey to people who care about education is fun for me. I want to thank particularly those of you, the, the friends who are, whose ongoing support of IAS makes all of this possible. Uh, for me, this has been just a remarkable year, right? Uh, just a chance to, 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 to open up doors in my head that I didn't know had been closed, right? And I, and I know my colleagues here would say pretty much the same thing. Um, First confession, my title, you know, somebody asked you to give a speech, you give a title, you don't think about it at the moment, right? <laughs> uh, so I gave him this big, big, aggressive, ambitious title. Then I sat down to, to actually write the thing and realized there's no way in the heck I can do that in 40 minutes, right? <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take maybe 10 minutes, something like that, and we're going to pretend that I'm talking about the topic that is, is, is up there. Then the rest of the time, And in my own way, in a, in a kind of a roundabout way, I, I am reacting to the issues of police violence and race. I'm not going to talk about that, right? But what they underscore for me is how difficult it is for us to talk about race, right? So out of that big issue, what do we know about, about making the urban education experience better? I'm going to take what is still a pretty big slice, right? What role does race play in the process of preventing decent education what role could it play in the process of facilitating better education, right? Uh, and again, I'm doing that just, just, just because the events of the last year have made it so clear how hard it is for us to think about race, let, al let alone talk about it. So in a very oblique way, I am going to talk about that. So I will be trying to make four points. Uh, uh, first up is, is just that I'm pretty sure that the way most people think about urban schools is, is outdated. There's, there's more dynamism, there has been more change 
across the country for poor children, urban children, minority children than most people are aware of. It's really important for people to get clear about this because much of our national discourse is premised on the idea of the universal and unvarying failure of urban schools. And on the basis of that assumption, people try to make policy. If that assumption is wrong, the policy goes off in the wrong directions, which is exactly what I think much of our policy has been doing for the course of my lifetime. <laughs> Um, therefore, point two follows naturally from point one. Much of, much of the uh, uh, current debate, I think, is, is just about the wrong thing. Uh, for me as a researcher, you know, one of my curmudgeonly remarks is in the last 20 years, we've gotten much more rigorous research. And what that means, actually, is we have much better qu answers to the wrong questions. Um, I'm just going to state that point and fly. We can argue about it later if you want. Then I just want to say, I want to talk about how race matters. Again, that is a big topic, but I'm going to try to say some things, and particularly I, I, I am interested in the connections between race and vulnerability, right? And we'll come back to that several times, and then time allowing, uh, I would like to end up by talking, how, how do we do race better in our schools, and in our communities, and in our families? And we'll see how much of that we, we, we can touch on. Um, so point one, just urban, most of the data, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because it's all, it, it, it's all illustrative. There's, there's nothing I, I think I need to spend a lot of time on. Um, most of the data that, 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 that I'm going to be presenting, I could not have shown you 10 years ago. It did not exist. Uh, a great deal of it didn't exist five years ago. This really is about fairly relatively recent. There were a couple of exceptions, right? National assessment of educational progress is considered, you know, the nation's report card. Uh, proficiency on this, which is what this chart is about, is a, is a very high bar. It's a very predictive bar. Kids who, who, who reach proficiency on this, we can tell you some, some good things are likely to happen to them later in life. Uh, if so if you take that high bar, all, all, all this chart is saying is that over the last test reading for, for younger students, uh, you have a district, you have districts at the bottom, Detroit and Cleveland, which, which, which are in the single di digits. You have districts at the top, um, which are, th which, which, let me see, how, where are we there? Three districts. Uh, the, na the nation average is 35% proficient, which is not that great, but, <laughs> but again, it, it actually is a quite high bar, right? So it's not as bad as that sounds. The nation average is 35%, but there are, there are at least three urban districts um, that, that outperform the nation. And, and they do this consistently year after year, testing after testing. Not always those, but they're, they're always in the hunt. But it's the range, it's that variation, right? And, and part of my point uh, is that we have not been trying to figure out what, what drives that variation, which is, I think, just criminal. Um, same point in another way. If you just look at low income, if you're gonna be poor, be poor in Miami, Tampa, don't be poor in Cleveland, which is probably obvious, right? Uh, uh, so that again, f uh, uh, the best districts on this measure are doing, say, four times better than, than, than the worst district. And again, that's, that's young, fourth grade, that is to say, uh, low-income students. If you want to look again at national data over a longer period of time, what you see, uh, again, looking at nine years old, is that for most groups you have, over that long period of time, a kind of uh, a gradual incline and also a reduction in gaps between groups. I'm not a big gap person. I do not think the achievement gap is the way to organize our thinking about these issues, right? But no nonetheless, it is good to see them, see them declining. Uh, math, the same, uh, same general pattern. Uh, this chart is messed up. <laughs> These colors should be distinct. Uh, Supposed to go green, orange, red. What it's supposed to say is that if you look at 1996, uh, in the proficient and above category, only 3% of African Americans and 7% of, of Latino Americans made, made the category we want to see as many kids as possible in, right? If you jump forward to 2013, that's eight, it's 18 and 26, that's, a, that's pretty substantial. It took some time, but it's substantial progress, right? And if you look at it the other way, 
how many black kids are in the, where well, you don't want kids, below basic. You can live with basic. But below basic, you cannot live with. That goes 73, 61, and then 34, 27, right? I mean, that's a heck of a change. And that change, or whatever's driving it, is not shaping the national policy debate. I mean, I, I can't cite you a paper that gives a plausible explanation for that change. Um, now you want you want stagnation? Look at our look at our high schools. Right? Uh, by many measures, academic measures, our high schools um, have not changed. There, there was substantial progress for minority groups up until about the late 1980s, and then since then, pretty level, pretty level achievement and level gaps. On the other hand, two years ago, the nation's, in terms of attainment rather than achievement, two years ago, the nation's high school graduation rate crossed 80% for the first time, and then it stayed there uh, in the last year, 2012, for which we currently have data. I couldn't find a 10-year table. If I had a 10-year table, it would say that the national rate increased about 10%, 71% high school graduation rate to 81%. And the largest gainers were blacks and Latinos, and particularly Latinos. I think that's about, uh, it was more than a 15% gain for them. What's well, a 15% gain just in that six year period? Uh, it's attainment, but now there are, there are places, there are places that will graduate anybody. Um, Newark, New Jersey is probably one of them, right? I mean, people are getting high school diplomas there at a really, uh, impressive rate, and it's, some of it's probably uh, paper diplomas. Uh, but there are other places, uh, including New York City, um, in which both attainment, how long kids stay in score, and how well, how, how well they do by measures of college readiness. Um, this has been a, a, a remarkable experiment, experiment with 123 small non-selective schools that were designed to be rigorous, that were designed to be personalization, to be personal ex environments, where teachers were selected on the basis of who wanted a certain kind of close out of class contact with students, and they were designed in close partnership with their, with, with, with their communities. They were designed to replace the largest, most, most unsuccessful high schools in New York. Uh, they have now graduated something like 21,000 kids. Uh, and by the way, this is random assignment, because we often can't be certain what's driving the effects that we get. Here's one we can be pretty certain. This is, in fact, a school effect, right? And over that period, um, sustained impacts on graduation with Regents Diploma, which is understood to be a college readiness mark. Um, positive graduation effects for every subgroup. It says students entering with low proficiency in math and English. That's nearly all the students in these schools. It's like 85% of them, right, uh, enter well below grade. Males and females, the, the largest groups were black males and Latino males in terms of which groups had the largest increase in graduation rate. Um, I'm just saying this because I'm sure in an audience like this there are people who have had IB experience, international baccalaureate experience, right, and just, just, in terms of how things are branded, we all assume that that's an experience that is for upper middle class kids, right? I mean, it grows out of a certain kind of history and a certain kind of culture. There was a situation in Chicago where kids who were achieving at the average level for the city of Chicago, which ain't too hot, okay? For the average level of the city of Chicago wound up going to IB schools, or quite, quite good IB school, actually. Um, the punchline is that for those kids who stayed, right, there's all kinds of stuff behind that phrase, right, <laughs> because only two-thirds of them stayed in a program. But, that, but you know, that's still, that's two-thirds of, of kids coming from backgrounds that most of us, myself included, would have said are not going to be able to handle IB, right? Uh, for those who stayed, compared to a comparison group, 40% more likely to attend a four-year college, 50% more likely to attend a selective college. And for all kinds of reasons, we want kids in the most, well, we don't have to tell. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, international baccalaureate. Very sorry. Uh, should have said that uh, from the beginning. So these are really, really, really strong pops. Uh, and the last I knew, which I'm probably a year or two behind on, on these studies, these kids are in college, and even though they're struggling some with the social issues, they're doing quite well academically, right? They are persisting at very high rates in, into college. Um, 
this is just here because the whole state of Massachusetts, which in some way often considered the, the, the uh, most successful educational state in the country, although Maryland actually beat them out on last year's test, uh, they just do a lot of things better than the rest of us, including the way in which minority students and low-income students have progressed in, in, in both states. The MCAS, the state test, is, is universally considered one of the most difficult in the country. Oh, not <laughs> I got you looking at one slide and I'm talking about another. <laughs> Hold on here. <laughs> this is the slide I should be talking about, right? So just look, uh, black students passing what is, again, a very difficult test, reaching proficiency on that list. Starting in 1998, uh, black and Hispanic students are around 10 percent, and by 2012, they are up around 60 percent, right? White and, and, and Asian students are going up faster. There's still a gap. But this is why the gap formulation is not so appealing to me. Kids who reach proficiency on these tests, even though they may be behind white students, can outcompete most Americans academically, right? They're, they're, they're in the game, even though there is, there is still a gap. Uh, that's a math slide. We'll skip that. Just to, just, just to make the, the, the point, because obviously the question is what's driving all of this. Uh, part of my answer is intellectual rigor for kids who don't ordinarily get intellectually rigorous programming, right? And this is just one, oops, oh, I see what I'm doing. One example from uh, Boston. Uh, how many kids get algebra in the eighth grade? It goes from essentially none in 2007. In just five years, they have half the kids in, no, 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 uh, half the white kids in the city. 40% um, of Hispanic kids in the city, 34% of black kids in the city. In just five years, they've gotten large numbers of students taking algebra earlier than they would have in the past, right? And so it's, again, it's a remarkable piece of planning. Um, to the question, to the question, um, what's driving all of this? Uh, what, what, what? If you ask me when my fellowship year is over, <laughs> I'll be able to give you a much more definitive answer, right? Or at least I hope so. When this project is over, I, I, I should say. Um, but right now, much of the case that I am, I am, I am trying to make is that the places which are doing better seem to me, on a fairly consistent basis, one to use resources more strategically right, than other places. And that often means resources follow needs in these systems. Right? It is not about trying to equalize resources. Some kids are getting more because they need more. Right? You know, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I've, I've already mentioned the issue of academic rigor. I've already mentioned the issue of personalization. Those are, again, two of the themes that I think we find in a lot of these schools and school systems. Um, I haven't said as much about what I really think is, is, is the straw that stirs the drink, uh, and that's leadership. Leadership both at the building level and at the senior level. In some cases it's one, in some cases the other, in some cases it's too few cases, it's both, right? Uh, but it is leadership that is ordinarily catalyzing change. And, and I say right now, that is largely guesswork. It is largely guesswork because we don't have very many people trying to figure out these variations, right? The, the, the national discussion is about what happens on average. And for me, I've come to the conclusion that the notion of average, the notion of central tendency, if what we're trying to do is make change, is just a dead end. On average, urban schools are bad. They are destructive. But that doesn't mean that's all that's out there. And we've been so bemused by the average, we don't look at the outliers, right? And I'm arguing you have to look at the schools that come closest to giving kids what you want them to have, and then you back engineer. You back engineer uh, from that. And so, um, in my humble opinion, much of what we spend our time talking about at the national level, at the state level, uh, is, is just a lot of tail chasing. It is a lot of looking for get-rich-quick schemes, a lot of discussion about governance and rewards and punishment for teachers and firing teachers. This really is a lot of the national discussion. You know, Michelle Ree, former chancellor of the D.C. school system, on the cover of Time magazine, posing around this theme of let's sweep out the bad teachers. It's an insult to the profession, right? It is such 
a reductionist way to think about how we change schools is not a, yes, of course the teachers are bad, we need to find ways to either make them better or get them out. Nobody's arguing that. But there's more leverage, there's more traction. I didn't realize. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I can't turn the dang thing off because I need the timer. <laughs> I had no idea that, I was like, which one of you is making so much noise? <laughs> Uh, but this, it, 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 it is such a virtually mindless way to think about what we are doing. We need to be thinking about how we create strong faculties, not how we get rid of individual teachers, right? And that faculty, I'm supposed, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize, that's not just the individual teacher, it's how teachers as a group interact with one another, right? That's a powerful driver of change. Um, that said, then to go to, so my next point, to go to my next point, uh, race matters in a whole lot of ways, right? R r r race sh shapes the degree to which people can work with one another. That's partly because it shapes the degree to which they trust one another. It shapes, uh, again, the point that I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on now, the degree to which people feel vulnerable or capable. Uh, how resources get, to get, 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 get distributed. The ghetto is, in fact, a system for the redistribution of resources, right? I don't know if people already only think about it that way, but that is, in fact, what it is doing. Um, the, the likelihood that students will indeed accept the student role, some will, some won't, depending on how race is presented to them. Um, and what I am going to do now is just sort of walk through some of the data um, that I think illustrates, illustrates that point. And we are going to start with a simple table that, uh, gee, I just don't think we, t a, a, a simple table that has, I think, enormous import. Forget about schools. Take the general, general population in this country. Uh, you go out and you create an, a, a set of questions that are intended to measure whether people generally trust or distrust their fellow human beings, right? Just create an index of questions like that, right? You give that question, you give that questionnaire to an American population, and this is what you're going to find, right? Um, that whites uh, have, are, are least likely to be highly distrustful. Hispanics, over half. African-Americans, African you're getting close to two-thirds who are highly, genuinely distrustful, right? Now, if we had time and enough wine, it would be good to have a discussion about the historical patterns which drive that. Uh, to my knowledge, we have 30 years of data on race and trust, and it's just about the same, all right? Moreover, uh, you could go to Europe. I don't know of a European country in which the pattern is different, right? And when I say the pattern right now, I mean the general pattern, with, with very, very few exceptions, is that groups which are defined as socially disadvantaged Groups which are, are considered socially vulnerable will not trust as much as other groups, right? So that there's a relationship between this notion of vulnerability. So that in the American data, for example, uh, students, who, folk who have graduated from college, other things equal, are more trusting than folk with a high school education. Folks who are professionals are more trusting than those who say they are struggling economically. Uh, and again, these patterns of trust by race and class are stable across the decades and seem similar in, in many countries. And the most common interpretation is that if you don't have many resources, you cannot afford to trust because the cost for you of misplaced trust is too great, right? You don't have the resources to, that will allow you to make a mistake and recover from that mistake, right? Rabbits cannot afford to trust. For the wolf, it's okay. They can afford to. They can afford to let someone in their home. Right? To that point, at this point, trust matters greatly. In term, if, if you take two schools, match them for everything that we can match them for. Two low-income urban schools. Let them vary on one thing only: the degree of trust in the building. Right? Trust means teacher-teacher trust and teacher principal trust, and so far as we can tell in urban systems, they are both generally low, okay? And not a whole lot of trust among the faculty, uh, let alone between them. Um, and I think, 
This is over a three-year period. But over a, if, over a three-year period, schools where teachers trust their colleagues and their principals are three times more likely to get better than troubled schools which don't have trust, right? And again, we're trying as much as, we, as you can uh, create a situation where trust is the only thing that's varying. It seems to, to, to be powerfully associated with change. At the individual level, this is a study from about a couple dozen small high schools in Chicago. Uh, same kind of thing. You're trying to match schools on as many variables as you can, but you vary them on the degree to which students who are being interviewed say, I trust most of my teachers. My teachers know something about my life outside of this class and so on, right? Uh, where you have strong teacher, student teacher trust, these are freshmen actually, almost positive these are freshmen. Uh, they come to school uh, a week more over the course of a year and they get one and a half fewer Fs. And for freshmen, attendance and Fs are just crucial in predicting whether or not they're going to get out, whether or not they'll be around for seniors. So again, I'm saying trust varies by race, it varies by, by social status, and it drives at both the individual and the, the, the institutional level. It seems to drive the possibility of getting some of the outcomes that we want. That said, I want to look at this. Right? Suppose now you ask teachers, do you trust the parents that you have to work with? Saying, you know, just construct an index of several questions. Uh, these, this is city of Chicago. Um, what you find is that teacher-parent trust varies with the racial composition of the school. It's highest in integrated schools, uh, so-so in Latino schools. It's African-American schools, schools with a predominantly African-American population, where you are least likely to have teachers say, I trust the parents that, that I have to work with when it, on, on, a, on a daily basis. You know, we think about race and disadvantage in a whole lot of ways, but the point I am trying to make here is that one of the disadvantages that, that adheres to race is that some kids are less likely to grow up in a context where the adults trust one another than other kids, right? And I suspect that is an enormous disadvantage in their lives. This is a kind of a similar point, a very predictive variable in schools. Again, you want to know which schools are going to change. You go and you ask teachers. Is a fight in the hall. Who's responsible for that fight? Is every teacher in this building responsible for every fight? Or who's ever student that is fighting, those teachers need to take care of that, right? How, how, do, how do you think of responsibility in these schools? And, and, and schools where the answers are more toward the whatever happens, every one of us is responsible for every child. Again, that's a very predictive response. Where are you, what, what, what kinds of schools are you most likely to find teachers taking that, that uh, all of us? all of us attitude, schools that are integrated, you know, same pattern. Least likely to find a sense of collectiveness among those who are teaching in majority African American schools. They are most likely to be saying, whatever we do, we do as individuals, right? And again, I don't think, you know, you have to say more about what that's going to lead to. Uh, this stuff I'm going to just, just slide through. Point is just that certain kinds of instructional resources are differentially distributed by race, especially those, ha ha ha, which have to do with 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 with, with intellectual rigor. So, uh, students of color are are least are less likely to have calculus in their high school, more likely to be have math classes taught by out of field teachers. Uh, this one is oh the colors are back. Uh, this one's kind of interesting, right? You make up a simple index for, for measuring the quality of a teacher. It's no big thing. It's, did the teacher go to a good school? Does the teacher score well on exams? Uh, I, I, I forgot what, what some of the other, but it, how, how much experience does the teacher have? But you make up a simple index for, for judging school quality. Then you look across the state of, of, of Illinois to see how high quality teachers are, are, are distributed. And what you see is that and the, the, the high quality teachers being represented by the green, right? And schools that have the lowest percentage of minority students, you have the highest percentage of high quality teachers. And in schools which have the highest percentage of minority students, you have the thinnest green line. I suspect that you in the back can't even see the green line. And <laughs> I, I just suspect that captures the reality that, that is out there. Uh, and we also know that the students who profit most from top quality uh, 
from top quality teachers will be minority students and, and poor children, right? So the distribution is actually the exact opposite of what we would do if we wanted to have, if we wanted to have uh, maximum impact. And I think, there, there, there are several pieces of research, this is just one of them, which suggests that the way in which teachers judge students depend on what they think, depend on how they identify the student racially and ethnically, uh, and in some ways they use lower standards for judging the work of, of minority students. Uh, this is a series of slides that I think are just fascinating for me. Uh, you make two almost opposite kinds of points about different ways to think about race and vulnerability. Ron Ferguson on the faculty at Harvard has this project. Uh, it's not a random sample, but it's a sample of several thousand kids from Midwestern schools. And uh, he goes out and he asks kids, what, what's, tell me what a good teacher is. What do you want in a teacher, right? And he, and he does this with thousands of kids, and he takes their collective answers and he creates it. This is a kid-defined definition of good teacher. And look at it, it's pretty sensible, you know? Uh, the kid's just saying, look, I want somebody to make the work interesting and enjoyable, and I want somebody who, who does not let me fail, right? Somebody who is relentless, right? Somebody who actually forces me uh, um, to give my, 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 my full effort. Uh, makes us think, welcomes questions. And if we don't get it, the good teacher is the one who will, who will stick with us. So you, so you create this index, right? Based, and, and by the way, my dissertation research involved a very similar, I was trying to figure out why kids in a tough school behaved for some teachers and not for other teachers. So I had to, again, create their definition of good teacher. It was almost exactly this, even though it was done 30 years, 30 years apart in, in, a, in a different part of the country. Um, you create the teacher index. Then you ask, teach, you ask kids, now, of the teachers you have right now, how would you rank each of them on the index, right? Then you ask them, of the teachers you have right now, which ones do you cut the most, <laughs> right? Which one do you act up for the most? Which one, blah, 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 right? And here's how that looks. And if you ask them in which class do you behave, it is, and this is gonna be the pattern of most of the slides, right? Black students' behavior is most affected by what they think the teacher, by whether they think the teacher is a good teacher or not. Asian students are going to do whatever it is they do irrespective of what they think of the teacher, right? And watch, watch, how, watch this line, whether they think it's good or bad, they do that thing, right? Whatever it is, that's focus. Um, which classes do you, do, you, do, do you show up for on time and, and come to most? Again, it's black and Latino students, actually not that much difference, right? Um, but the one difference is that Asian students are, again, least affected by how they think the teacher thinks of them. They're, they're, it's, it's a kind of internal, not external motivation. Uh, which classes are you most confident about your capacity to, 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 to measure the work? Black students are the most affected by what they think of the quality of the teacher in front of them. This one is, no, this one's the same. Where do you complete the homework? You get black students at one end and Asians at the other. This is the one that's different. Are you willing to go in a given class and ask the teacher for help? Black students, well actually, black students and white men, but it's white females that, whose behavior is gonna be most affected by what they think of what the teacher thinks of them. And, and so, that, that's a different, so. that to me suggests a kind of sensitivity, a kind of vulnerability to, 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 to the environment, right? Um, that, that there's a kind of sense that, uh, just a different level of need, and I'm gonna call that a different way to think about vulnerability. This is the sort of the same body of research, but he's asking a different set of questions, he, Ferguson's asking a different set of questions. He's asking young children now, about some of their, ha the nature of the supports they have at home, right? Check this out, it's another way to think about vulnerability. So if you ask grades one through six, um, do your parents want me to tell them what I heard in school? Everybody, what I learned in school, everybody's fairly high, uh, except that Asian students are lower. That's again, but it can be consistent through, it's also consistent with a lot of other research. 
my understanding. If you ask them, someone there to help, grades one through six, right? No racial differences in the way in which they perceive availability of help at home. If you ask, here's the one, right, that needs some explanation, right? Do you read at home almost every other day? Now listen, when kids are very young, the answer is yes, for everybody, right? Over time, they begin to diverge, and they diverge in such a way that white females are the highest and black males are the lowest, right? What the hell is happening, right? And again, it's not anything that we can explain right now, but again, I think that's, that seems to be the pattern. Now, who watches the most television? Blacks, Hispanics, whites, least Asians. It gets worse. Uh, for those of you in the back, it's percentages with televisions in their, in, 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 in their bedroom, and it's low 80s for blacks, a high 70s for Hispanics. I'm going to say average 40 for whites, uh, and 30 something or another, middle 30s for uh, um, Asian students, right? But this notion of televisions in the, uh, in, in the bedroom. Um, I have never seen a coherent explanation for the well-established fact that blacks and Latinos uh, watch a good deal more television than anybody else in this, in this uh, country. It is really very clear that television watching is associated with a number of, 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 of negative outcomes, including participation in violence. Um, for blacks, by the way, it's 37% more television than other Americans, which just sounds like an incredible number to me. Um, I just, this is a different way to think about vulnerability. This is a kind of vulnerability that is, has to do with in-home dynamics, right? Uh, that has to do with kids being exposed, not to be too judgmental, to, to, to certain values which are likely to be destructive. We know that unless you're a white male, if you're young, a great deal of television watching has negative impact on your self-image. Right. White women and minority children of, of, of either gender, right? Uh, there's a lot of reason to, to think of this as, 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 as an additional vulnerability that, that is correlated with race and something, frankly, that we could, I think, do something about if we, if we mobilized around it. And so, oh, this is the stuff that's gotten so much publicity in the last, over the last year because the Justice Department released uh, uh, a new database. But the just point is, is, is that black students are three and a half times national average, more likely to be uh, suspended than white students. Um, black students and Hispanic students receive harsher punishments for exactly the same, for exactly the same infractions. Uh, and where is the disparity greatest? The more subjective the, the, the offense, the greater the, so there's not as much disparity uh, about hitting, which is a relatively objective thing, either you did or you didn't. Uh, as about defiance, as about having a bad attitude. It is on those judgmental calls that black and Hispanic students are most likely to be disadvantaged. The differential is consistently noticed by students of all color, including white students, um, uh, although they, they, they have a different way of interpreting it from the way in which black and, 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 and Latino students um, uh, interpret it. This is one of the many reasons that one of my stock pieces of advice to teachers in schools is that they need to talk about being, stop talking about being colorblind. Schools all pride themselves. I can go into Prince's schools right now and start a discourse about race and the teachers are going to say, we don't see race. We see every child as a child. We treat every child the same. And then I can look at their discipline figures, right? And it's going to, I don't know, Princeton might be different, but you'd have to show me the data. Uh, but when, 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 when teachers sort of hide behind, if you will, this ideology of color blindness, what that tells to minority folks is, is it tells them that their perceptions are not valued and legitimated in the environment in which they're in. Because there's nothing about these day-to-day -day experiences that they have that feels color blind to them, right? So students, students, schools going around talking about we don't see race. Uh, I think it's just exactly the wrong signal to send. Uh, and this is, this is, a more, recent, a more recent piece of research, I don't know what to make of it, but it is from a quite large data set. And what they find is 
not only are there disparities across race, but within race, for at least for girls, I have not yet seen this data for, for boys, right? Um, girls who are darker skinned are more likely to be punished than girls who are lighter skinned, right? Uh, I don't know what to say, except that that frightens me. Uh, we can skip that. Uh, so then the question becomes, where are we for time? The question becomes, uh, uh, so what do you do with this, right? <laughs> right? I mean, how, 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 do we, how do we speak to this? And logically, there are two options. Either you can create kids. This is almost a way to think about the, the Asian path. You create kids who are so strong internally that what happens in their environment does not bother them. Right? You make stronger kids, right? You make kids who, who, who can walk into a classroom, see the teacher is racist, and say, this is interesting. I know, you know, but, but, but not be intimidated by it, right? This, this, is, this is a puzzle that you have to solve, that's all. Uh, that person has a problem, not me. Uh, that's one way to think about it. The other is, how do you create an environment in which the environment is giving kids and parents, for that matter, signals which counter some of this vulnerability that, that most environments are, are generating. So I think what I will do, given, given uh, that I should stop talking and get to my wine soon here, is that uh, I'm going to give you one example on each side, right? Or what to do about the individual child, or what to do about uh, environments. Then we'll go to questions, and uh, maybe I'll, t I'll give other examples. Just, to, just see, we'll see how, how the time runs, right? But. Uh, uh, I don't want to go to stronger kids. Uh, one way to say this is, uh, oh boy. Ah. It would tell us who's here at Princeton, I believe, in the history department. Um, has it done a series of studies around the notion um, that um, culture can be, your identity can be a buffer. I mean, one of, one of his arguments is that this, this quite disturbing pattern that we've seen in the data of the, it's beginning to turn, by the way, that we've seen in the data for, for a number of years, is that each succeeding generation of children descended from Mexico is doing worse academically than the previous generation. It's a reversal of American historical patterns, right? Uh, and TELUS has gathered some data which suggests that specific part of what may be happening is that as children leave their ancestral culture and derive their sense of who they are increasingly from a larger culture which sees them in negative terms, certainly in, 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 in much of this country, they lose a kind of buffer that protected their parents through their development. And so that more specifically, uh, the students who did best in, in, in one of these studies were those who had a bicultural identity, students who had little identification with their ethnicity and students who identified only with their, their, their culture of origin, both did badly. It was students who saw themselves as in some senses bicultural uh, who did best. And in another, there, there's a, there are, if, if you look at African Americans, European Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, you, for all of those, we have evidence that having a strong racial identity, ethnic identity, protects against multiple negative influences in the environment uh, and promotes academic growth. This is one of the more methodologically stronger studies about African American and European uh, adolescents and determines that African American adolescents' positive adjustment, uh, much more affected by whether or not they had a positive sense of themselves as African Americans, and when they had a negative sense of, of this is not who I want to be, I don't want to be associated with a stigmatized group, I wish I could get away from these people, those negative psychological outcomes, including depression and problem behavior. Sort of my favorite sort of study, one of my favorite sort of studies, and this is uh, Wong Echols and Samaroff, 
interview eighth grade is at two points in time. I think it's the beginning of the school year and at the end of the, 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 the school year. And partly what they wanted to know is, do you see, have you experienced discrimination in this school? And the most common kind of a, 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 a discrimination for these kids, by the way, was people thinking that they were dumb, that they couldn't do, that they couldn't do academic work. Once kids perceived discrimination, it just, when they thought that's what their environment was, the general pattern was it just knocked them off track, right? Uh, grades went down, self-concept, self-esteem, resiliency, uh, more anger, more attitude, and the one that really zings, they thought that, just what your mother said, right? They thought to hang around with the more negative kids in the building, right? But the exception to this were kids in the sample who had the strongest racial identities, right? For those kids, they could perceive discrimination and they just moved right on, right? Uh, it didn't affect any of those things, and it didn't affect the way in which it, it, they, chose, they chose their friends, right? So again, this underscores for me, two things. The importance of, of us learning to think about race as something that we can manipulate on behalf of kids, but it also underscores the fact that, you know, I, I do a fair bit of talking to teachers. Most teachers would, are not comfortable talking about what to do with this data, right? That's for, for reasons of foresight. Um, now, bear, 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 bear with me. My, my example of what is the most successful large-scale racial intervention into American schools? I submit to you it is the urban Catholic school, right? Uh, and one day I'm going to write a paper that, 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 that proves that. Uh, caveat here, right? Whenever we talk about Catholic schools, you ha we have to, to, to make some allowance for the fact that it's a self-selected sample. Uh, but myself and virtually every researcher I know who has tried to figure this out we think something else, that, that, that certainly may be a part of it. Oh, and the it is black and Latino students consistently do much better if they go to Catholic schools, right? And, and the, 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 the numbers are not even close. Uh, so take this with a grain of, 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 of salt. Um, but most of us are, are convinced there's something about the atmosphere, the culture of the Catholic school that drives some of the better influences. And, and Bryken, uh, Bryken Lee, uh, I think the book was just called The Catholic School, but whatever it is, it's the most extensive uh, study of this. And, and the heart of what they say is that however much it may contradict our stereotypes about Catholic schools in the old days when they had nuns with nuns cracking kids upside the head for raising an, an eyebrow, their point is, by and large, the nuns crack every child upside the head, right? Uh, and, and, and kids will accept that kind of behavior if they're utterly convinced it is not invidious, right? And if they are further convinced that people are, 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 are quote, hitting them, disciplining them, being strict with them, because those people are invested in their growth academically and morally, uh, then again, the, 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 the mere fact that they are being dealt with in such, such stringent ways, as we might say, does not necessarily bother them. So that one of the most important things about Catholic high schools, they argue, is that they don't use tracking, not in the way that most other, 80% of American high schools are tracked. Uh, every child and most high is in some kind of college prep. Now, obviously, some are way behind. Some are way ahead. But their response to that is typically to give the kids who are way behind more teacher time, you know, resources following need. But everybody's going to learn some Julius Caesar if it kills you, right? Uh, and they don't, they, don't, they don't necessarily mind that. Um, but that kids are having a common high-level experience, right, which in itself says something about how the institution values you and sees your potential the fact that you have a much stronger sense, at least again in traditional Catholic schools, of community, that they are deeply concerned with the lives of kids outside of school, which is in itself a kind of vote of confidence in kids, and that they see education as a moral enterprise, which is itself leveling, right? Um, the, the message is not that God loves a doctor's son any more than he loves a janitor's son, right? That, that the issues of morality are the same for all of us, and at that level, again, we are all equal. The people who most need to hear that kind of message are the people who most stigmatize 
by messages of their being not equal and not as, not as, um, not as valuable. Um, sorry, I lost something else I wanted to say. I lost it, but I think the point was that that kind of atmosphere, right, a, a kind of, I'm going to say leveling atmosphere, I see that in some, I don't know if any of you knew Chad School when it operated in Newark, uh, it was 20 years ago, but that I knew of it anyway, right, and a, a very black independent school that operated for a long time. Uh, it had this kind of atmosphere, right? We, we, we are on a mission, right? We're all on this together. If any one of us fails, every one of us fails, right? But that kind of, it, it, it just, I, there are charter schools that I think establish this sense of moral purpose. I've seen church schools, especially Pentecostal schools, uh, that establish this sense of moral purpose and egalitarianism. There are different ways to do it, right? I think the Catholic school is a kind of model for me of, 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 of one way to create a kind of, uh, a kind of institution uh, that is affirming, that embraces children, right, and that speaks to some of the negative things in the environment. So that's one example, I think, from both sides. We're going to skip for the moment. No, we're not going to skip these. Uh, we're going to skip. Uh, and I'm going to make sort of my two final comments and see what kind of questions or comments folk want to want to have, want to make. Uh, and obviously, I have been trying to stress vulnerability throughout. Um, I could actually do a whole talk on the vulnerability of teachers, right? Uh, if there are certain things that make students vulnerable, there's a whole other set to, to, of, of things that make teachers in under-resourced environments vulnerable. I could also very easily do uh, more than a talk on the nature of vulnerability in the lives of, of children. So what, what I am trying to encourage folk to do is to think of urban schools as institutions which on the one hand are shaping who's going to get what level of resource, and on the other that are just factories for creating certain kinds of insecurities and vulnerabilities, not in some of their actors, but in all of their actors, right? And then folk come together and try and try uh, to work out. And part of what this means to me is that all these conversations about how we motivate teachers, how do we motivate students, uh, even the conversations about how we do better professional development with, with teachers, they're sort of missing the point, right? Uh, if we make people more aware of their own possibilities, more confident of their own possibilities, much of the motivational issues will be gone, uh, and they will react to professional development in a, in a much different way. So uh, that's, that's one thing I wanted to stress. The last thing I wanted to stress is that I'm all, I always worry now that when I talk about interpersonal relations, trust, people will sort of focus on that um, and forget trust has structural roots, right? The capacity to, to trust depends on where you are in the social system. We, I think that's, 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 that's really clear right now. Uh, and so I just, I, I, I simply just want to encourage us to not separate the issue of, whether, of, of how people interact with the fact that we're giving people a difficult job to do, we're putting them in an under-resourced environment and we're saying good luck. And you do that to people and they turn on each other, right? And then you get this mutual dance, right? In which what you do generates my dis distrust, what I do generates your distrust and it simply spirals down, right? But a whole lot of, of this is easier if you just have more teachers, right? If you just have smaller classrooms, if you just have the best teachers, in the places where they are most needed. If the resource distribution is different, I can almost guarantee you that the interpersonal issues will be different. Now lastly, lastly, I will leave you with the words of America's foremost child psychologist. Um, I'm gonna read this one. Every time you stop a, a school, you'll have to build a jail. What you gain at one end, you lose at the other. It's like feeding a dog on its own tail. It won't fatten the dog, right? <laughs> I, mean, I just think that's Mark Twain saying to us, we have to take the idea of investing in children much more seriously than we have, right? Uh, we just have to invest in them. That's, that's, in the end, everything I know, right? So we will stop there, uh, and we'll, we'll see what kinds of questions you have, okay? Or comments. Thank you.